Hi folks, Alan reached out to us and said, I've got a problem. I want to machine this part on my Tormach 440, but the cam strategy is taking forever to calculate. What am I doing wrong? So let's pack this video full with as many tips and tricks and things to think about when you're tackling cam, especially roughing strategies in Fusion 360. I'm using an HP Z2. It's a dedicated CAD computer, it's certainly not the most powerful out there, but it's decent. A card here to our article though on all of the details behind what sort of specs you wanna look for on optimizing a computer or workstation for Fusion 360. First off, I see his toolpath time of two hours and 21 minutes. If you don't have the time listed next to your toolpath, go up to your name, preferences, under manufacturer, choose show operation machining time. It's not always a perfect number, but it will certainly give you a ballpark estimate. And most importantly, it will show you the relative difference. So speaking of that, let's right click, duplicate, and we'll now create a comparison style toolpath. The first thing I'll look at when someone has a toolpath that they say is taking a really long time to calculate is I'll look under the passes tab at the tolerance. Allen's model here has, actually it was a metric model, but just slightly under four thousandths of an inch, or in this case, exactly one millimeter. That's completely acceptable uh, and quite standard for a roughing tolerance. What you want to be conscious of is the tolerance value relative to your stock to leave. And it's really important to understand what the tolerance is. The way adaptive toolpaths work is really cool. Behind the scenes, the software is actually creating an STL file, a tessellated model. It's taking this perfect parametric solid model and turning it into a bunch of approximate triangles. And it's using those triangles to calculate the optimum direction for the toolpath to go to maintain that optimal load. It will not exceed that optimal load. It may go slightly underneath it. That's what makes it that adaptive style toolpath that's so good at maintaining constant engagement. And you tend to see this when the tool is diving into corners. But the tolerance means how much the STL file can vary from your solid model. So if your tolerance was greater than your stock to leave, it's very likely that you will gouge your model. So in the inch world, we would normally have a tolerance of four thousandths of an inch and the default stock to leave infusion in the inch world is 20 thousandths of an inch, which means our stock to leave is five times greater than our tolerance. These tolerances and stock to leaves also play a really important role in the whisper cuts that you sometimes see. If you're wondering, why is my fusion model cutting air? It's that stack up of tolerances and rest machining or moving between operations that matter. So we've got a whole video dedicated on solving that here. The smaller this tolerance value is, the more accurate the tessellated model will be, but it massively increases the compute and the solve time for the toolpath. To demonstrate that, I've duplicated the toolpath. The only difference is the first one has a 15 thousandths of an inch or 0.38 millimeter tolerance. And the second one has a 1 thousandth of an inch or 0.025 millimeter tolerance. We also ran these calculations when I wasn't using my screen recording software, which is quite taxing on the computer and these results were significantly faster. If you are worried about a really long toolpath calculation, whether it's one of the adaptives or one of the 3D machining toolpaths, I find that the percentage sometimes appears to be frozen. Take a look at the data size of the file. You'll see the kilobytes ticking up even while the percentage sign doesn't change. That tells you Fusion is still chugging away and doing fine, it's not stuck or hung. The other thing you can do again is under manage task manager, and you can get some more detail behind what's happening there. If you're going to use an abnormally large tolerance to improve your calculation time, just remember to ensure that your stock to leave, especially the radial, is some amount larger than that tolerance. Okay, back to Alan's adaptive toolpath. One of the other things that jumps out is that it's a 5.8 megabyte toolpath. There's a direct correlation between that megabyte size and the posted G-code. Luckily, PathPilot and most modern processors can handle large files just fine. But any older VMC without things like high-speed machining or decent look ahead are very likely going to choke on this much data. Now, there's a couple of problems that we're gonna fix here to reduce that file size. But if we look at the diameter of this part, it's only a 77 millimeter or approximately three inch part. There's no reason an adaptive toolpath needs to have that many lines of code in it. So why does it? Well, first off, we've got too many depths of cut. 
Those depths of cut are driven by the maximum roughing step down value. But the first question is, is this a 2D or a 3D toolpath? And unfortunately, it doesn't tell you in the name. It just says adaptive. So the trick is to look at the icon. If we see that shaped icon, that matches the 3D adaptive clearing icon, not the 2D adaptive clearing. So we've got too many step downs. Adaptive toolpaths are modern. It's also called high-speed machining, trochoidal machining, dynamic machining. It's designed to use a longer axial cut and thinner radial cuts. And here's the good news. Fixing that is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to massively reduce the machining time and the compute time because the 3D adaptive is recomputing for each step down layer. So if we're going from nine to one, there's a chance we're reducing our calculation time by almost 90%. So much faster. But why do we have toolpaths on top of our part? And why didn't the toolpath go all the way to the floor? It's machining on top of the part because the toolpath starts at your top height and goes down to the bottom height with one caveat, which I'll get to in a second. Our top height here is listed as stock top. Well, what is our stock top? We've got to close out of the toolpath, hop back into the setup, and we can see we've got our stock defined in yellow here. Now we could update our stock, but if there truly is stock, maybe we would have faced it first. And so all we want to do here is focus on the adaptive sort of within the solid model we could fix that by changing our top height to model top. But why didn't it go to the bottom? Well, this is the exception I just mentioned. Under passes stock to leave, we've got 20 thousandths of an inch or 0.5 millimeters of axial stock to leave. There are no shelves or other layers to this part. So we can reduce that to zero, but we'll want to keep some radial axial stock to come back for cleanup passes. and our toolpath is calculated. Interestingly, we only have one step down. Now, I didn't change the maximum roughing step down. It's been set at 0.25 inches, or it's about 6.3 millimeters. If we look at the length of our part, it's 0.236 millimeters. So why didn't our previous toolpath result in one axial depth of cut? Well, the reason is, again, the heights tab. Originally, we had that set at stock top, so it's going to divide up the area between stock top and the model bottom, and split that up subject to our maximum roughing step downs. So fixing that to model top coincidentally also solved that issue. So now we've got a part that is 728 kilobytes, approximately 20% the previous size. It's gone down from two hours and 21 minutes to 21 minutes, uh, but there's actually quite a bit more that we can do. First off, we see these red ramp ins. These are helical lead-ins that are driven by this ramping section on the linking tab. And ramping in is much better than plunging with an end mill, but if you have to have drilled features in the part, I would recommend pre-drilling them with a twist drill. It's a much faster way to remove material, but a couple other pro tips around the ramping. Number one is the ramp clearance height is set to approximately 0.1 inches above the top height. That is a mile in the machining world. And sure enough, you can see it. We're spending all this time ramping in air. My default for that is 10 thousandths of an inch or about 0.25 millimeters. That ramping action also tends to be quite slow. So we'll get some free productivity gains by trimming those ramps. Only a few minutes. Nevertheless, free time we just found. If you were able to change them to, say, pre-drilled locations, you would want to use the same geometry that you use for your pre-drills. So we could go back into the design area. We could create six points and we'll use those not only for the drill locations, but also for the adaptive to tell it where the pre-drill location holes were. Using pre-drills is gonna reduce your compute time as well as our machining time. Forgot to do the center hole here. Nevertheless, you'll see our machining time drops down from 20 minutes to 18 minutes and 30 seconds. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned that adaptive machining benefits from deeper cuts, but thinner cuts. So what is the rule of thumb? Well, like so many things, there's no absolutes. And there's things that we won't get into, like the material and the tooling and the capability and accuracy of your machine, the speed of your machine. But generally speaking, 100% axial depth of cut is safe. And by 100%, I'm referring to the diameter of the tool. So if we're using a two millimeter end mill, which is approximately 0.08 inches, we can at least go that same diameter in terms of the depth. Normal practice is to be up to 200% depth of cut. So you can cut as deep as twice the diameter of your tool. Now here we're going closer to 3.2 times or 
we're cutting about a quarter inch deep divided by about a 0.08 inch end mill. So that is considerably less safe. Is it possible? Absolutely. But if you're newer to this or you don't want to break your tool, two different options here. Number one, start easy. Reduce your maximum roughing step down to the 200% of your tool diameter. So 0 0.078 times two. Or if you really want to run it in one depth of cut, we'll go back to that quarter inch, but reduce your optimal load. A normal optimal load will be 20% of the tool diameter. And in fact, if we right click on that and say edit expression, we can see what Fusion has programmed. Now here it's 40%. I'm going to say 20% should be the normal and probably what your Fusion default is. But if you want to be more conservative, we can edit that expression and say instead, let's stay 10%. So if I were running this part on a 440 and I really wanted to use this tool, but I wanted it to be safe, I would do the full depth of cut, but the lighter optimal load. But unfortunately, we've regressed back to a tool path that's going to take way too long to calculate. Uh, and that's where the world of CAM is really meeting the realities of tooling and machining. There's no reason to rough out a part this large with such a small tool. We need to separate this up. We need that small tool to do these nooks and crannies, and I want a larger tool to quote unquote rough this part out. And it's a good time to talk about the differences between the 2D and the 3D menus. 2D is a bottom up. When you start a new 2D adaptive, Fusion has no idea where to do work. And in fact, if I click OK, I get an error saying no pocket left in machine. You literally have to build up the toolpath by starting to select areas to do work. Again, compare that with the 3D menu where if I pick adaptive clearing, I've already got a tool selected, click OK, Fusion will start generating that toolpath. It's a really important thing to understand and ironically, the toolpaths have really little to do with two-dimensional versus three-dimensional calculations because within 2D, you've got toolpaths like trace that can move along three axes and in 3D, you've got toolpaths like horizontal which are in fact really only 2D style toolpaths. We're going to wipe this toolpath here in a second, and I'm going to show you how I would do it. But there's one more thing that's worth noting, and that's the difference between the adaptive operations and the pocketing. The options are available in 2D as well as 3D, and pocket really gets overlooked, including by me. Uh, if you're working on a large part or any part where you've got long adaptive calculation times, the beauty of pocket is that the toolpath calculation is almost instantaneous. That was real time. The reason it's so quick is it's a dumb toolpath. It's not building that STL file in the background and making really intelligent decisions about where to move that tool to maintain that optimal load. This is the old school, old style toolpath that's going to increase your tool load as you move into corners. So if you ran this with a small diameter tool, it's potentially going to break it. But if you're using a really strong rigid tool or an open cutting tool, a great example would be the shear hog. Pocket plus a tool like the Shearhog can be an excellent way to quickly rough parts and quickly generate cam tool pass. On the other extreme, we had a student at one of our training classes who has an amazing large five axis DMG doing huge suspension parts uh, for a household name auto company. And their problem was the adaptive tool pass were taking hours to calculate, even on a high end workstation. We switched it over to Pocket. He was using, I believe, a Sandvik face mill that was able to handle varying loads as that face mill roughed into corners, no problem at all, and certainly well within the horsepower capabilities of the machine itself. And switching to pocket reduced his calculation time from hours to mere seconds. So how would I machine this part? I would most likely start with a drill. We keep a drill set up partly for this exact reason. I'd use that twist drill to handle all those initial holes that I can. Then I'd use a quote unquote large end mill relative to the part size. So here that probably would be a quarter inch. And I would start with a 2D adaptive. Because my part is only approximately a quarter inch tall or about six millimeters, I know that that end mill is gonna be able to handle it in one depth of cut. 2D adaptive clearing. The pocket selection geometry doesn't seem to behave. When I choose this line, that's not what we want. But the trick is to re-click that blue line once and let up. Now this new window pops up. I'm going to switch it from the current open contour selection to closed contour. It picked the wrong closed contour, put black lines around this. So to fix that, I'm going to hover somewhere over here on the part and click once. 
and that alone fixed it. Infusion usually does a pretty good job of getting what you want, as long as you pick a feature relatively far away and there's a common flat line like there is on this part. Don't forget to check the green plus mark to accept that selection. And we now have a 2D adaptive set at a 20% optimal load and 20,000 stock to leave. I'll click OK. I've also added a quick facing operation. So we'd come in, face the part, and then start roughing around the periphery of the part. With the quarter inch tool, only able to partially get into those nooks and crannies. Going the 2D adaptive route is going to make it a bit easier to control where the toolpath does work. In this case, it's only handled the outside of the part. But if we wanted to just lay down one toolpath that's going to handle most of our roughing, I would have done the same settings except with the 3D adaptive, again, picking our pre-drill positions. The nice thing about the 3D option is we can then right click, create derived operation. We'll do another adaptive clearing, but this time we'll pick the smaller tool, the two millimeter tool, but we'll enable rest machining. Rest machining stands for remaining stock. Switch the default to from previous operations, click OK. It's now going to build that STL file, but it's going to do that based off the prior work that has already been done. And so it's, you can see now it's taking that smaller tool and working its way into each one of those nooks and crannies. If you have a part that has just too many of these features for a 3D operation to calculate, you may well be better off doing a 2D adaptive, picking one of the pockets. So I'll hold down the Alt key to pick this edge, click on it again, let up, leave it on an open contour, I'll click this far edge to leave that as my pocket selection. We can create a toolpath for one of those pockets, and then we can right click, add to new pattern. We'll choose circular pattern type, pick any of the diameters to drive that. Now, unfortunately in this model, we don't have the parametric build data. So I don't have a say pattern that I can look at in the CAD side to see how many teeth there are on this gear or part, but what I'll usually do is just count the approximate number. So it should be about eight per quart for a quarter of it. So we'll start with a 32 pattern. Uh, that's wrong. Looks too dense. I'll try 30. And that's right. To double check that, when we run our simulation, turn off the model light bulb. Make sure you're in comparison mode. Set the tolerance at whatever you want as a desired tolerance. Two thousandths of an inch would certainly be adequate for this part. And I can fast forward through my whole toolpath. If I have gouged the part, it will be in red. And if I have remaining stock, it will be in blue. We still have remaining stock here because again, this was just an adaptive toolpath. So we've programmed it to leave some amount of radial stock throughout the part, but that confirms I've got the pattern done correctly. I've got one more tip. Anytime you're working on operations that are very processor or intensive and take a long time, increase things like your optimal load, your tolerance, increase your step over, do anything that will reduce the calculation time. That's gonna let you generate the toolpath that you wanna see more quickly. And once you're happy with the toolpath, you can come in and make final adjustments to things like tolerance, smoothing, maximum roughing step downs, et cetera. As always folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. If you're interested in learning Fusion 360, we have hands-on classes here in Zanesville, Ohio, and we have a new online Fusion 360 CAD and CAM class card here for more information on that. Otherwise, folks, take care. See you soon.